Welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith, welcoming you to our live five days a week look into all things Oakland County. Today we'll be talking to artists uh, as well as other in, as well as others in the community about topics important to you right here in Oakland County. Let's get into today's headlines on our website at CivicCenterTV.com on our local news page. Our top story today is from Robin Erb at the uh, at Bridge, Michigan, and their coronavirus tracker as cases have jumped 19% just as hospitalizations have increased 8%, but rates still remain far below levels during other than during other surges. The state health department added another 16,586 confirmed cases this past week. That's up uh, to an average of 2,369 per day from last week, where there were 13,956 cases for an average of 1,994 per day. Hospitalizations rose to 975 on Monday from 904 last week. Many patients likely tested positive for the virus after entering hospitals for other ailments. Only 4% of patients, or, or 33 in total, are on ventilators, according to state uh, records at this time. In the past week, Michigan recorded another 96 deaths linked to COVID-19 this past week, bringing the total uh, to 30 of 34 to 4,250 deaths in total throughout the pandemic. Also making headlines on our local news page at civiccentertv.com from the Detroit Free Press's Ed White, thousands of unemployed people in Michigan were wrongly accused of fraud and can seek cash from the state. Thousands of people who were wrongly accused of fraud when seeking unemployment benefits can seek financial relief from the state now, according to the Michigan Supreme Court, which ruled on Tuesday breaking, breaking new ground when someone claims their constitutional rights have been violated by the government. Quote, the state is prohibited from violating the rights of the, that the Constitution guarantees. If it does so, it is liable for the harm that it causes, in closed quote, said Justice Megan Kavanaugh in a writing uh, in a four to three opinion on the court. The three dissenters were justices nominated by the Republican Party, the four nominated by the Democratic Party. An automated computer system used during the administration of Governor Rick Snyder was a disaster over a two-year period. People were accused of cheating to get jobless aid. They were forced to repay money along with substantial penalties before the Unemployment Insurance Agency, or UIA, finally acknowledged widespread errors that affected more than 40,000 people in the state of Michigan. Although refunds were dispersed, the state still is being sued by people who argue that their due process rights or right to be heard were violated while they try to untangle themselves from the mess. Some victims had to hire lawyers to fight false fraud findings. Others filed for bankruptcy, lost wages, suffered poor credit ratings, or had trouble finding a job and even housing as a result of the crisis. The state Supreme Court said that it has the power to step in, especially when the legislature hasn't come up with a law that offers a remedy to people whose rights have been violated by the state of Michigan. Quote, if our Constitution is to function, then the fundamental rights it guarantees must be enforceable. Our basic rights cannot be more ethereal hopes if they are to serve as the better rock of our government, wrote Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, in dissent, Justice David Viviano said the majority opinion was, quote, thunderbolt, and quote, with a stunning sweep, and closed quote, whatever that means. He continued on by saying, quote, it represents a gross overreach given that the judicial branch is, has now seized legislative power to fashion remedies for all matters of constitutional violations. A deluge of cases and swelling of taxpayer liability will surely ensue, in closed quote, said Viviano, who was joined in his dissent by Justice Brian Zara. Viviano said it's the legislature's job to approve a solution if there should be one. And, and that is all in this article from the Detroit Free Press with more uh, Supporting information also linked in this article from Ed White and the team at the Detroit Free Press. Finally, making headlines today on our website at civiccentertv.com from Shantae Lewis of the Detroit News. Petitions submitted for ballot initiatives are, uh, have been approved to raise Michigan's minimum wage to 15. Activists and state officials for National Worker Coalition One Fair Wage on Tuesday submitted petitions for a ballot initiative pet petition that would boost Michigan's minimum wage to $15 and eliminate sub-minimum wage. This hasn't been approved yet, it's just been submitted. More than 600,000 signatures were collected in an effort to put the question to voters in 2024, said One Fair Wage co-organizing director Marcella Gutierrez. Gutierrez. 
Initiatives need a little over 340,000 valid signatures in order to make it onto the ballot. Advocates for the proposal gathered Tuesday at the Yum Village restaurant on Detroit's east side after submitting signatures to the Secretary of State's office. Supporters at the gathering included Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, Attorney General Dana Nessel, and State Senators Stephanie Chang and Mallory McMorrow. Quote, this is a really exciting moment because it's it is a marker in history where we are stating unequivocally that the state of Michigan, our people and elected leaders need to declare that working people deserve a wage that can support a family, and closed quote, said Garland Gilchrist. The petition's filing comes after a Michigan judge ruled this month that a pair of 2018 voter-initiated laws increasing the minimum wage to $12 and instituting paid sick leave requirements for employers should be put into effect, saying Republican lawmakers' strategies to circumvent them violated the Constitution. Before the initiatives could reach the ballot, both were adopted by the GOP-controlled legislature, which then slowed wage increases and eliminated the proposal to increase sub-minimum wage for tipped workers. The action by lawmakers kept the current hourly wage minimum at $9.87 per hour. The judge's ruling is expected to be appealed. Quote, we are going to get it back on the ballot, McMorrow said. We saw the court's decision. This is a huge move in the right direction. But as we saw in the recent Dobbs decision on the federal level, court rulings are not are also not settled. So that requires all of us getting into it, in closed quote. Attorney General Nessel said, quote, I remember watching the process unfold in the state legislature where you had two Republican majorities who adopted the language of these very popular ballot proposals and then proceeded to wait until late to completely gut them, in closed quote. Michigan Chamber of Commerce President Jim Holcomb said the latest ballot initiative and the state's decision to overturn the legislature's actions could do more harm than good to families. Quote, such a provision could generate significant significant harmful unintended consequences for Michigan employers and employees alike, spurring a ripple effect in, to our state's job providers and in turn our families, communities, and economy, ultimately hurting the very workers it purports to lift up, in close quote, Holcomb said in a statement. And, attorney, and uh, Brian Kelly, chief executive officer of the Small Business Ex Association of Michigan said, quote, this type of government, uh, government action is a big part of the reason why we are now facing such devastating inflation, which hurts lower income families the most. We should not make a bad problem worse with this proposal, in closed quote. Attorney General Nessel said it boils down to providing families accessibility to financial stability. Quote, every person in the state of Michigan should be able to pay their electric bill and put food on their family's table. You shouldn't need to have three jobs in order to support yourself and your family, and closed quote. All those headlines making news today on our website, civiccentertv.com, on, on our local news page, as well as those ever helpful links to, uh, to accurate and up-to-date information on COVID-19 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services in uh, Lansing, and of course, the Oakland County Health Division in Pontiac. We have a great program ahead on this Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Up next, Dr. Udi Capen of the Birmingham Village Players joins us, followed by Barry Goodman from the Goodman Acker law firm at the bottom of the hour. This is the Oakland County Metcast. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments 
made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Oakland County. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program on our website at civiccentertv.com on our Megacast link where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast is Dr. Yubi Capen, playwright and director of The Final Frontier, one of several original one-act plays written by local playwrights right here in Oakland County that you'll see at this weekend's Birmingham Village Players Playwrights at Work One-Act Play Festival. Dr. Capen, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Appreciate having you on. So uh, first off, uh, give us some... Uh, insight into uh, the play that you're directing because you have not only directed this play you have written this play it's called the final frontier and you'll see it at this weekend's birmingham village players one act festival tell us about the f the final frontier and, and a little bit about the storyline sure um well the the play itself is basically my love letter to star trek um the the plot line involves uh um a meek bank executive who's totally dominated by his wife. She ridicules everything that he likes. Uh, she's only interested in social climbing. And the thing that she ridicules most of all is his love for Star Trek. And he figures that uh, this is gonna be his life and he accepts it. But when reality gets a little bit too much for him, he retreats into his own little fantasy world of Star Trek. And then he unexpectedly uh, meets uh, a kindred spirit, which uh, gives him uh, some hope and some inner strength that he didn't know that he had. So this is a lot to get through in one act of a play. It's usually about 30 to 40 minutes uh, at most for, for a one act play. And, and so there's so much exposition that has to happen to 
create that connection with the, with the audience between the characters and really help them understand the situation the characters are in, but also to progress the story and make it go somewhere, make it have meaning and, and resonate with the audience. So as you're writing a play, especially a one-act play and telling a story like that, how do you approach that as, as an artist to convey all that information, but also compact it into just a one-act play? That can be a challenge. Uh, all I've written is short plays, anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 minutes long. And it is a challenge sometimes to get the entire story out in that uh, short amount of time without sacrificing um, uh, character development, without sacrificing plot. But uh, I've written a few of these so far, and I've uh, gotten, I think, a little better at uh, becoming efficient, with uh with with words with lines with uh plot devices so that uh what maybe would have taken me at the beginning uh five pages to establish i can now establish with maybe one page of dialogue so so basically it's it's just a matter of uh finding ways to say things um without too much extraneous detail and uh, it, it's it's doable. So you are a pediatrician by trade, not, not not a playwright. This is something that you do as a hobby and you enjoy doing. How is being part of playwrights at work and having that group of people that are also just local regular people that enjoy your theater and want to also dabble into playwriting, how does having that support group help you as a writer develop these stories and also develop your skills and your interest in the theater? It helps very much. Uh, it's, it's a great bunch of people uh, in this one playwriting group that I belong to, Playwrights at Work, through the uh, Birmingham Village Players. And uh, they're all experienced playwrights, so they have great feedback to give, great tips to give. We meet uh, generally a couple times a month, and we bring our works to the meetings, and they're, they're, they're read. Uh, uh, frequently acted out at the meetings. Um, and uh, the, the, the give and take is invaluable towards improving each of our skills, each of our individual skills as a playwright. So we learn from each other. And uh, I've, uh, I, I've belonged to this group for a little over three years and I've uh, definitely noticed and felt the evolution uh, in uh, my my ability to to bring a story to life because of the great people that I've been able to bounce ideas off of. We're joined by Dr. Udi Kappen. He is the uh, playwright and director of The Final Frontier, one of the several plays you'll be able to see at this year's Birmingham Village Players Playwrights at Work One Act Play Festival. That's happening this week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, July 29th, 30th, and 31st. The 29th and the 30th, Friday and Saturday, uh, shows are at 8 p.m. at the Bir Birmingham Village Players, July 31st, Sunday, 2 p.m. matinee. Tickets are $11. It's $10 online plus a $1 processing fee, $11 tickets you can find on BirminghamVillagePlayers.com. BirminghamVillagePlayers.com. Dr. Capen, you're also the director of, of this play, of, of your own one act. Having um, have, you, have you directed before a one act play like this, or is this your first experience? This is my first experience. Um, it was partly because of having some difficulty finding someone to direct the play, but also for a while I'd, I'd kind of wanted to try my hand at directing and this was a good way to get my feet wet. Does it make it easier for you or how does it make it maybe a little bit easier for you to direct a play that you have written, the uh, of characters that you've created, you know them uh, from the base level to the most complicated level. How does that help you in this first directorial experience of yours lead the way and really put your original vision to fruition? Well, there are actually arguments on both sides as to whether or not a playwright should direct his or her own work. Even within our group, there's uh, some debate about that. Um, and I understand the arguments on both sides, but actually I feel that it helps. Um, as I'm writing a play, I'm basically, and this may not be the experience of every playwright, but as I'm writing a play, I'm basically directing it in my head. So um, by the time the play is finished, I have 
largely already got it worked out uh, to how it's going to look in real life. So it, 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 in my case, it definitely helped me. Joined by Dr. Edie Capen, he is the playwright and director of The Final Frontier, which you can see at the Birmingham Village Players at their Playwrights at Work Group's One Act Play Festival happening this Friday through Sunday in Birmingham at the Birmingham Village Players. It is their One Act Play Festival. BirminghamVillagePlayers.com is the website. BirminghamVillagePlayers.com is the website. Friday and Saturday, 8 p.m. at the Birmingham Village Players uh, and Sunday at 2 p.m. are the show times. Go to BirminghamVillagePlayers.com, click on Playwrights at Work, and you'll find more information as well as how you can purchase tickets online in advance of the One Act Play Festival happening, again, July 29th, 30th, and 31st in Birmingham. Uh, Dr. Capen, as you are working in this group with other playwrights, other theater enthusiasts, in the local area. What has been the most surprising element, at least for you, in terms of the communication and the learning experience that you get for someone that is interested in the theater, but is doing this as a novice with other novices in the local area that are just passionate about what they're doing? Well, from a personal standpoint, I've been involved in community theater for, for decades now, of course, probably about uh, a good 30 plus years. Uh, almost exclusively as an actor. So I've, I've uh, made a lot of uh, contacts, a lot of friends in the community theater community. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I've had uh, um, experience acting in like dozens of plays. So, but, uh, but playwriting is new to me. It's, it's still just the last few years that I've been doing that. And I guess, the camaraderie that I've experienced among uh, playwrights is similar to the camaraderie that I've experienced as an actor, which is great. It's one of my favorite parts of this whole process. Uh, I guess if anything has uh, surprised me, it's uh, how both how difficult it can be to uh, get an idea onto paper. Um, I've definitely experienced writer's block, as I'm sure everybody has it at one time or another. But when inspiration hits and when you actually do get an idea, sometimes the ideas come out of my mind and out of my hand and onto the paper almost uh, faster than I can process. So it's definitely a dichotomy between how long an idea can take to percolate versus how quickly that idea can actually be uh, brought to fruition once it's uh, once it is percolated. Two four eight six four four two zero seven five is the uh, box office number for the Birmingham Village Players to see the Final Frontier as well as other one act plays originally written by local people right here in Oakland County and being shown right here in Oakland County uh, just off of Woodward Avenue in Birmingham at the Birmingham Village Players again that is Friday July 29th through Sunday July 31st Saturday Friday and Saturday shows are at 8 p.m. Sunday it's a matinee at 2 p.m. Again, at uh, 34660 Woodward Avenue in Birmingham at the Birmingham Village Players. BirminghamVillagePlayers.com or 248-644-2075. For more information, we're joined by Dr. Yudi Capen on the Oakland County Megacast. He is one of the many playwrights and directors for the, this year's shows. And, and having been an actor, you mentioned you were, you've been a community theater actor for decades now, uh, Dr. Capen. And how does that help to translate to A, you becoming a writer now in, in this capacity and, and writing The Final Frontier, but also to directing and kind of flipping uh, flipping those roles on its head, sort of, uh, so to speak, from where you've been an actor for all this time, you've experienced different directors, different writers, different styles, and now you're on the other side. How do, how do you make that change? I think it has helped me quite a bit. Um... It, uh, I, I've gotten to see the styles of many different directors over the years. And I think in my in this, my first experience as a director, I've probably borrowed either on a conscious or subconscious level from, uh, from many of them. Um, and as I said before, when, uh, when I am writing a play, I'm basically directing it in my head. Um, but uh, also, uh, that also that translates also to uh, when I've, uh, at least lately, in the, in the last few years of uh, acting, as I think I've matured as an actor, um, when I'm acting, um, 
I'm also thinking to myself, uh, well, how, how should I do this? How should I play this role? How should I move at this point? And that has definitely helped me in uh, both my playwriting and in this, my, uh, my uh, initial directorial uh, effort, because not only am I directing the play in my head, but I can hear the actors voices in my head practically the actors who haven't even existed yet uh so it's one has definitely helped the other we're turning back to uv keeping one of the many members of playwrights at work and the birmingham village players you can see their one act play festival friday saturday and sunday at the birmingham village players just off of woodward avenue in birmingham more information birmingham village players.com 248-644-2075 is the box office number once again 248-644-2075 for more information dr keeping as someone that loves the theater has been involved in community theater for all these years uh, and now in uh, really all capacities from acting to directing to writing and, and beyond, if someone is interested in community theater or if someone's never even thought they may be interested in community theater, why should they join a community theater group? What benefit can it bring to their life? That's an excellent question. Um, we're actually lucky that this particular area, Southeastern Michigan, Oakland County in particular, is an excellent area for community theater. There are many groups that are top quality and that are welcoming. Um, there are just so many benefits to being involved in community theater. Uh, the camaraderie, as I mentioned before, some of the best friends I've ever made, I've made through community theater. Um, I'm, I think most of my friends, most of the people who know me would characterize me as a relatively quiet, shy individual. And a lot of them, if they've never seen me on stage before, are pretty amazed by uh, what they see on stage compared to the person that they know in real life. So it really allows you to be somebody else. Um, it uh, allows you to um, uh, get your creative outlet. Uh, get, get, uh, to, to, it, it provides a wonderful creative outlet. I've been, as a pediatrician, I've been around thousands and thousands of kids over the years. The best kids I've ever been around pretty much have been theater kids. They are uh, intelligent and good students. They, they pull for each other. They're creative. And um, I highly, highly recommend uh, that uh, uh, parents encourage their kids if they have any inclination whatsoever to get involved in theater. And that goes on to uh, later in life also. There are just, just so many benefits to it. Dr. Kaven, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else at this time that our audience here know that we haven't discussed about uh, playwrights at work, about the Birmingham Village Players, or about the Final Frontier? Um, well, as far as playwrights at work go, um, we we do a few of these festivals every year, and we uh, would love as many people as possible to come to them. We do two festivals of short plays every year in, in a typical year, uh, and as the name indicates, uh, those are shorter works, maybe about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we do one of these one-act play festivals a year, which are more like 30-minute or 35-minute plays. Um, and it's a great way to see some original theater um, in, a, uh, in, in a friendly environment. And it also allows the audience, this is part of our festivals, we allow the audience to ask questions uh, afterwards of the playwrights and give their own feedback, which is great for both the audience and the playwrights. So I highly encourage people to come out and, uh, and enjoy this upcoming festival and the others that we, that, that, that we hold. And uh, the theater itself, Birmingham Village Players, uh, the group, top notch. I uh, highly encourage people to uh, enjoy everything that Village Players has to offer. Dr. Kipper, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. More information can be found on the Birmingham Village Players website, birminghamvillageplayers.com, birminghamvillageplayers.com to learn more information about playwrights at work. Purchase tickets as well. You can also call their phone number at the box office, 248-644-2075, 248-644-2075. And again, the One Act Play Festival uh, through Playwrights at Work uh, at the Birmingham Village Players is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week, July 29th and 30th, Friday and Saturday. Saturday, 8 p.m. Sunday, July 31st, 
2 p.m. show. More information once again, BermanCountyVillagePlayers.com. We'll take a quick break on the Oakland County Megacast when we return practicing law in Oakland County. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health condition. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong be like happy having fun everywhere everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused i believe you i'm so sorry this happened it's not your fault confidential and anonymous help is available at the michigan sexual assault hotline connect with us 24 7 Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health condition. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine to keep safe and strong be like happy having fun everywhere everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine
Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast, our live daily one-hour program about all things Oakland County. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program by visiting civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Oakland County has a number of exceptional law firms practicing in a variety of areas of expertise and helping people like you navigate whatever legal situations or questions that you may have. Joining us now on the Megacast is one of the many leaders of those entities, Barry J. Goodman, founder, uh, founding partner of the Goodman Acker Law Firm. Barry, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. So you, as I said, you are one of the founding partners of the Goodman Acker Law Firm. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your career leading up to uh, co-finding co-find, this, this firm and a little bit about the mission and the history of the Goodman Acker Law Firm? Sure. Um, as I said, my name is Barry Goodman. Uh, I came to Michigan after graduating from law school in Florida. I worked in Tampa for a couple of years for a small firm. Um, came up here in 79. Took the bar, passed, got a little, uh, my first job in Michigan as an associate at a firm that doesn't exist anymore. Um, moved on to a, a firm that uh, I became a partner after, you know, during the 13 years I worked for them. I met Jerry Acker, the other founding uh, partner. Back in 79 when I moved, I went out to the Jewish Center in West Bloomfield every Sunday morning and played basketball. Uh, ran up and down the court with you know some old pistons too, like Terry Tyler and others. Had a like, great time. Met Jerry Acker. Every week we would meet. Then we started getting together. Our wives got together, and it came to part sometime later in '93 that we continued to be friends and said, "Let's create a law firm and do this together and create a mission to help people that is different." and more proactive and more family-oriented than the average law firm. We care more about the people we represent um, than, you know, just cashing in quickly. Uh, so we created that firm, uh, originally Gordon Goodman Acker and then Goodman Acker in 1993, Goodman Acker in 98, and, and Goodman Acker continues today. Um, going back, I'm uh, born and raised in the New York area, then. Uh, moved to Jersey in another suburb of New York called Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and ended up in law school in Florida, and, uh, you know, then found my way here. So Goodman Acker was created to, to help individuals who can't help themselves, that don't have a voice that was hurt due to the negligence of others. We started a small firm of uh, three partners and a couple associates and a couple of secretaries, and we're now close to 30 individuals uh, with a dozen partners, a uh, dozen lawyers, uh, four partners, and three paralegals and marketing individuals, intake individuals, accounting uh, representative, HR, the secretary, um, to a point where we have created what I think is one of the most outstanding law firms in the state of Michigan. A lot of it is because of my partner and I became interested in figuring out why our clients sometimes weren't getting the benefits of what the law had to offer. And that's because the law was suffering at the hands of insurance companies that had control of funding judges getting elected so that they were more conservative, more to the right, and felt that corporations and insurance companies should be held less accountable than the people that they might have hurt. So we got involved on the political side of things and began to um, find judges running for office that were more uh, pro-individual, who will take a look at any case that they have in front of them and say, how will it affect the person that has brought this litigation? Now, they don't always win because they didn't have the right position, but when you're making a determination, you take a look and you see how that individual might be affected. And we've set our, our firm that way, and we were successful in getting some right judges, and all of a sudden we were asked to be involved in um, our local county races of state legislators. We ended up then getting involved in statewide races, both for senators, for congressional, Governor Granholm at the time, 
attorney general before we were involved in there. Um, then we got involved even in the, the federal side where since Kerry, and you can look behind me, I've got pictures of three presidents and then Kerry and Clinton who didn't get elected going back over some 25, 30 years of being involved in presidential politics as the finance chairs for those individuals here in um, Michigan. And um, currently my partner and I continue to remain in this election coming up. We are the finance chairs for the second time around, uh, both in 18 and now in 22 for Governor Gretchen Whitmer in the hopes that um, she will get elected because governors have a lot of power in appointing judges and want to make sure the right judges are appointed. The ones that care about justice, not care about the dollars that corporations may have to spend. So got involved in all that. I became the president of the trial lawyers of the state of Michigan. So did my partner two years later. I was the chair of the negligence section of the state bar. Um, I am still uh, you know, on, on the Democratic National Committee for um, several terms involved there and also in the rules and bylaws committee. I was PAC chair of the trial lawyers for 13 years, I believe. Um, I, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to be recognized by the Michigan Association of Justice for their Champion of Justice Award, the Oakland County Democratic Party, their Wing of the Justice Award, Michigan Super Lawyers since it was created in 2007 through 2022. Uh, Law Drag, another national publication, chose me as one of the top 500 personal injury attorneys in the country. Uh, Martin Dale Hubble, AV related. I, I can go on and on with the um, awards, but what I care about in our mission here is quite simple. I hire people with like-minded that are driven and hardworking, that are competent, that are good people, that are customer service driven and are team players so we can all work together for the, the rights and needs of our clients. Because we care, we're very aggressive, we kind of have, I won't use the word hatred, but we're not a fan of insurance companies. Because it's very simple to understand their mindset. They charge everyone a premium. That premium is X dollars. Then they pay out claims at Y dollars. The difference between X and Y are billions of dollars in profits. Billions are not enough, they want more. So they look for tort reform to take away rights of people, such as the Michigan No Fault Act that has changed a few years ago here, where we have people like Konstantinov that can't get care because this law was too onerous and overbearing for most individuals to be able to even operate. They took medical providers and told them overnight that instead of charging $100, they can only charge $55, for instance, 55% of what they charged before the law went to effect. Now we're all a business. Could we all take a, a pay cut of 45% and be able to live? Could any restaurant, could, could GM or anyone take a 45% pay cut and, and still be able to survive? That's what happened here because the insurance companies and the Republican legislators had control. So we're here trying to fix that and work towards it and work around it to continue to give our clients the, the rights and that they deserve and the need for justice and to make sure that justice occurs. Um, We're joined by Barry Goodman. He is the, f the founding partner of the Goodman Acker Law Firm. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. More information can be found on the law firm by visiting goodmanacker.com to get in contact with them. And Barry, as you are consulting with your clients, uh, and, and if you have an issue with an insurance company and you have something that you need to work out, consulting with an attorney, getting all the information you can have on what power you have within the law to battle your insurance company to get the justice that you deserve is, is obviously important. When you when someone is going to you or going to your law firm about a case that they're involved in, whether it's with their insurance company or uh, the insurance company of somebody else and an injury that they're in, that, in a situation that involves their own injury, what are some steps that, that you suggest for these cl clients as they're coming into a law firm, yours or, or another, to put their best foot forward in battling the insurance companies and getting the compensation and the justice that they deserve in their specific cases? Well, when they come into our office, they're coming into our office for one reason. They were hurt in some fashion. Okay. And I will take a side before I finish answering the question to say that on the political side of things, I do have an election law department run by Mark Brewer and a new associate hired to help him that Mark was the longest serving party chair in the country. For 18 years, he was the party chair 
for the state of Michigan. And then when he left that, we hired him. And we are representing a number of congressional um, state reps. State, uh, we do all the financial compliance for them, make sure they're doing everything right so they don't get off the ballot as five of the Republican candidates for governor did because they couldn't get all this. They, they, they were defrauded by the company they hired to get signatures. Sure. You know, so I love to say that, you know, they've been looking for now almost two years to find uh, why the election in 20 was fraudulent. Here we are finding uh, election fraudulent by Republicans who can't even get on the ballot because they fraudulently tried to get there. Only on the Republican side. All the Democrats that we know, they um, were able to turn in the right signature. Well, Governor Whitmer was the only candidate for running for governor, but she did it right. So going back to the person that comes to uh, into our office, we sit down with them. We have as long a conversation as we need to get all the information. And the key is to understand their pain, to understand how this has affected them, how it affected their fans, their friends, their family, their ability to work, their ability to maintain their household, to pay their bills to keep a roof over their head and water and food on the table for themselves and their children. Um, so we lay all that out and what needs to be done. We want them to make sure that if they have pain, that they go to doctors that are competent and will provide them the care and be able to wait for the insurance companies to pay them um, and protect them from any of those bills in the meantime, so doctors feel comfortable in providing the care. Um, I like to tell my clients that uh, I only bite the other side because you're seeing a friendly voice here. Um, uh, I'm a Gemini, and so my anger side of things is taken out on the other side. My friendly side is taken out with my clients. Um, my clients are family to me, and that's how my firm looks at them. Not because I have a family of um, sons and fathers and things like that. That's not a family law firm. A family law firm is when the clients are your family. And I just got a... Um, a wedding invitation a couple months ago from uh, a child that I represented when she was five years old. Wow. Still, now come to my wedding. Thank you for assisting me way back when, you know, and the mother uh, set it out. And so I continue to keep track and follow my clients. Um, why we have like, uh, you know, 98% uh, success rate. We have the best Google rating, I think, of any law firm around uh, because we care and they're family to us and they'll always be family to me. So we want to take them every step of the way. We work on teams. My team has a secretary, has an associate who works with me, and has an outstanding paralegal. And the four of us, uh, you know, we'll bring in case managers, we'll bring in private investigators, we'll bring in medical record uh, reviewers, whatever we need to put together a package, present to the insurance company and determine um, whether or not they wanna be um, sane and pay early or fight about it and pay at the end and cost themselves more money. I, I like to, we're like a Fram oil filter here. You know, you can pay us now, you can pay us later, but you're gonna pay us. And uh, so um, we work in that fashion. I am not a fan of insurance companies. I love what I do. I love practicing law. I love representing the people that we represent. I go home, there's a pad of my, on my side table in my bed. If I wake up at three o'clock in the morning thinking something, I'll write it down so I don't forget when I wake up in the morning what thought might have come to me about that particular case. Um, so we move forward and protect them. And the only, I tell them, the only thing you can't tell me is I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, you're never bothering me. The more information you provide to me, the better I can represent you, the better the communication skills that we have here. And we pride that that they're informed and provided with answers to every question they have, they can just concentrate on getting better and know that a lawyer is trying to help them on the economic issue. We're joined by Barry, Good, uh, we're joined by Barry Goodman. He is the uh, founding partner of the Goodman Acker Law Firm. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. More information on GoodmanAcker.com, including how to get in contact with them for consultations and for services, GoodmanAcker.com. When it all comes back to it, Barry, it, it seems like advocacy really is one of those hallmark pillars of the work that you do in, in your own personal career, but also of the law firm, the Goodman Acker Law Firm uh, in general. So to, to you, what does it mean to be an advocate and how does that reflect 
on every step that you and, and your fellow partners, associates, and others that work for you uh, take into their daily work? Well, the work that we do and attorneys throughout the state do um, is a complicated, complex area of law. There's so many laws and they change almost daily, it seems like, and we have to keep on top of them. In fact, I, I teach um, and lecture throughout the country, Caribbean, Mexico, not a bad gig to be sent to um, you know, Cabo or Dominican Republic or Vegas or um, you know, Nashville or Austin and other places to, to lecture to like-minded individuals on advocacy and on making sure that you keep up with um, the changes in the law. This is one of the few states that continuing legal education, which most people don't understand, know about, is not required for lawyers. Accountants, doctors, they all have to have continuing legal education. For lawyers, it's voluntary. But we insist in our firm that we um, attend a certain amount of, a number of hours of continuing legal education. We're involved in those lectures, like I am, uh, to provide uh, the advocacy skills. We want everyone to um, go down to court and watch another lawyer uh, do their job and see whether they do anything better than we do. Uh, we do a tense amount of reading. Um, we do intense amount of writing. We have many blogs or whatever on our website. And, you know, the advocacy is a skill that isn't what it used to be. And we push it to be what it once was. So that you be ready before a judge, be ready before a facilitator, mediator, be ready to have discussions with the other side, with the insurance company, adjusters, to prepare the appropriate settlement packages that are detailed and lay it all out and win. That's our job, to win for our clients so that they have, they get their life back. Their life has been extremely affected in terms of an accident they were involved in. Uh, some of them are into therapy almost immediately. They can't handle it. And our job is to get them there and to make sure that they're being taken care of and they have the right mindset and they understand at the end of the day, there's a, a good possibility that hiring Goodman after their lives will be made it's not whole because we can't heal them at least as good as we, they possibly can be economically in order to live with the problems they still may have. Locations in Southfield, Sterling Heights, Dearborn, and Grand Rapids. More information on goodmanacker.com. Barry, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, uh, are we done or we're done? I was going to tell you that, uh, you know, we, as a family, we did a gun buyback uh, program. We assisted homeless vets. We have a law day regularly. Um, we did a part of the Flint Water Drive. Uh, we remodeled Durfee Middle School. We give back to the community all the time, and we're proud of that as well. And thank you so much for having me and uh, and being able to showcase Goodman Acker. I believe that we are the cream of the crop, and people should know. Thank you. Appreciate what you do, and thank you for joining us, Barry. All right. More information, goodmanacker.com to get in contact with them for free consultation and for uh, helpful resources as well in a number of different areas uh, in the law here in Oakland County. Let's take a break on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll continue the program on your radio homes for the show 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills on the other side of the break. We'll kick off the Michigan Megacast with Representative Brenda Carter, a Democrat from Michigan's 29th State Congressional District. This is the Michigan Megacast. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? 
kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. Can I ask you a question? Uh, why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Welcome to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, welcoming you to our live five days a week look into all things Michigan. Today we'll be talking to politicians, healthcare professionals, and more about topics of interest and importance to Michiganders like you. Learn more about the program on our website at civiccentertv.com by clicking on our Megacast link. We will find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV, our co-flagship. With us now on the Michigan Megacast is the state representative, Brenda Carter from Michigan's 29th district, representing several communities in southeastern Michigan. Representative Carter, thank you for being with us today. Well, Tyler, thank you so very much for having me. Appreciate having you on. So uh, among many of the issues affecting Michigan are issues, especially at the federal level, particularly the decision in recent months by the U.S. Supreme Court and the decision on Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization that ultimately overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, you joined other Democratic lawmakers at the state capitol uh, in June to protest the effects of Roe versus Wade being overturned in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women, Jackson Women's Health Organization uh, ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. Can you speak to how that's impacting Michigan politics also? Because here in Michigan, the law from the 1930s that also would, would outlaw abortion here in the state of Michigan is still uh, being held. It's not in effect at this moment in time, but that's definitely going to have a continued impact on legislation at the state level going forward. Well, Tyler, thanks for asking that question, and you're absolutely correct. I'm a very strong advocate against uh, the decision that was made in Washington. As it stands right now, abortion is still legal in the state of Michigan, thanks to the court blocking the enforcement of that 1931 draconian ban. We know the forces that are opposing a woman's right to choose won't stop at abortion. They're coming for contraceptions. They're coming for marriage equality. I would encourage all citizens out there to contact their legislators, not only in Lansing, but in Washington, D.C., and tell them where they stand on reproductive freedoms. In terms of Michigan's Democratic caucus, it's still in the minority at, at the state level uh, as you're going forward in your party and, and working across the aisle, too, to try to find solutions to many of these issues uh, with, with your Republican counterparts. Where do those discussions currently lie in terms of maybe 
changing Michigan's code uh, in terms of abortion and putting new laws into place that would then circumvent the 1930s law should it come back into effect? Well, currently right now, to my knowledge, there is no collaboration between the two. It's still very, um, very much a partisan issue, but that is not stopping advocates out there from trying to get our colleagues to understand that it's more than just uh, taking away a woman's right to her, her own body. It's about making sure that women are kept safe. Uh, what, this, what this law has done, overturning Roe v. Wade has done, is made it very difficult for women who are impoverished to seek proper medical care. You know, even in case of rape or incest, they're not able to get the care they need because of this ban. So this overturning the law. So where are we standing right now? I think there's some empathy on the other side of the aisle. There may be some, but it's largely a partisan issue. I join my representative Brenda Carter, a state representative from Michigan's 29th district, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Representative Carter, after a year of work, the Michigan Task Force uh, on Juvenile Justice Reform has met in Lansing and approved a final list of policy recommendations to reform the juvenile justice system in the state of Michigan. Can you give us an, some insight into the work of the task force and, and what some of those recommendations are to reform the way that juveniles in the state of Michigan that end up in the criminal justice system one way or the other uh, end up going through that system? Absolutely, and once again, that's a great question because it was an honor to work under the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist and legislators, uh, prosecutors, judges, community advocates, families. It was a, a, a collaborative effort to take a holistic approach to our current juvenile justice system. I was driven to join this task force simply because of some incidents that's happened right here in Oakland County that, crossed, that came across my desk. The most infamous one is the 15-year-old who was sent to juvenile justice to uh, excuse me juvenile court because she didn't do her homework. Children's Village is the court. So what we did over this year's period of time is that all of us came together and we looked at. Uh, issues that needed to be ad addressed, not only addressed, but reformed. Some of those were making sure that there was increased reimbursement rates for local courts and community-based services. A lot a lot of our services that are in the community still need equitable funding, and it depends on where the location is, but it's all across the state we have these issues with our juveniles. Uh, also creating, another thing we looked at was creating the juvenile indigent defense system, making sure that our needy, our most needy had a voice. Data collection was, we found that it was in silos. We had different parts of the state doing different ways of collecting their data. So what we're looking for is un uniformity across the state. Some of the fees that the family were be families were being charged were a little egregious. And what it did was it kept families away from getting the services that they need. So one of the, another thing that we looked at was eliminating the fees for families to make it easier for them to participate in uh, the whole entire process. I thought one of the significant things was involving the families because all too often families don't have a voice. Once their young person is uh, matriculated into the juvenile justice system, it almost like it's almost like a school to prison pipeline. So one of the things we thought we would do is create a statewide parent advisory council so they could come in and voice some of the things that they're going through and bring it to the judges and the prosecutors and even the lawmakers so we can come up with a resolve that most best fit that youth. And finally, we looked at, and it's a whole bunch of other ones, but I'm just giving the ones that I thought were really, really significant. This is the one that I focused on the most, which was eliminating the, the racial disparities. We found that a disproportionate amount of black youth were in the juvenile justice system for, for our things that may be perceived as egregious behavior, but was actually just the animated behavior of the youth. So we took a look and we actually did the demographics to see where the large pockets of youth were coming from. And we found, yes, they were coming from largely black communities. So we took a deep dive into that as well and looked at ways that we could divert divert the youth from going into the system in the first place by providing the necessary resources they need to 
you know, just deal with some of the situations that they're dealing with. If you look at some of the youth that are in majority, minority, or impoverished, because it's not just black youth, we have it all over the state, but it, the, the common thread seems to be poverty. If you look at those, it's because these youth have a lack of resources in their communities. So we're trying to mitigate some of those as well. We're joined by Representative Brenda Carter from Michigan's 29th State Congressional District, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. Representative Carter, uh, somewhat connected to the, to the issue of juvenile delinquency is also the gun violence issue. Of course, that affects kids in so many different ways, and it's affected kids right in your local area of Oakland County uh, just in the past year, of course, with the tragic shooting at Oxford High School. In terms of addressing gun violence, it's another one of those issues that easily turns into a, a pervasive us against them sort of mentality with the Democrats wanting to have more gun control effects put in place and the Republicans on the other side wanting to protect gun owners' rights to bear arms. What discussions have been had at the state level, particularly by, in a bipartisan manner to address gun violence in the state of Michigan and put more prevention tactics in place that that allow our local lawmakers and allow our local law enforcement also to help prevent gun violence in our communities? Tyler, thank you for this question. This is right in my wheelhouse right here because of the numbers of shootings that's happened not only in Oxford, but you may be aware of the seven-year-old in Pontiac my home city, who was just returning from school and unfortunately was gunned down. I think it took something like Uvalde, Texas, to wake everybody up. I knew, I know on, in Lansing, there are some empathetic uh, co colleagues on the other side of the aisle that do want, they, they want to put an end to this gun violence. And I, I do believe that we're beginning to see a breakdown of those barriers as we continue to impress upon them this is not about taking away their guns there are a lot of people out there that are responsible safe gun owners that have a right to have their guns but this is about taking the guns out of the hands of people who take them and shoot 19 kids and do two adults or you can't go to a uh, uh, a fourth of july parade without somebody feeling they have the right just to take your life. This is why we're trying to do it. And it was very, very, it was, I, I, I took a deep, deep breath when I saw what happened in Washington when bipartisan support put legislation in place to curb some of the gun violence that's happening in our nation. You know, we are number one for access of getting AR-14s in our hands. And we must work together as a collaboration and put the partisanship aside and see the real human damage this is doing to our children. We talk about our children. I cannot even imagine when I was going to elementary school to have to go through what those children went through in Texas or Sandy Hook. OK, or Oxford, you know, just going to school on a normal day. And if we put sensible, sensible gun reforms in place, you know, redlining, red, I mean, red flagging a person when they come in or making sure you have safe storage or the bill that I introduced, the one that says limit magazine capacity, limit the capacity. Don't make it so that you can reload and reload and reload and kill, kill, kill. This is some of the things that I believe that is, is becoming a human issue with all of us lawmakers. And I do believe in my heart we're going to see some movement on that. We're joined by Representative Brenda Carter from Michigan's 29th State Congressional District on the Michigan Megacast. And just for reference, uh, you, you mentioned AR-15 style guns uh, being used recently in many of these shootings, including in Buffalo at the grocery store that killed 10 people. And of course, at uh, the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, where 19 children were shot dead uh, very recently. Also, AR-15-style AR style guns is a great article in the uh, Detroit News today from Lin Lindsay Whitehurst at the Associated Press that these particular guns have brought in over a billion dollars in sales in the last 10 years. These are, high, these are highly marketable guns, and they're being highly marketed, and uh, for a variety of reasons. Not all of these are being used in school shootings, but to address those issues even further, you, you mentioned having these automatic or semi-automatic weapons in, in this uh, in this case, one that can fire high capacity, uh, high capacity rounds 
fairly quickly and getting those into the hands of, of people. Uh, what sort of measures can be put in place to limit those styles of guns at the state level? At the federal level, it's one thing, but at the state level, how do you go about addressing specific styles of guns or specific kinds of magazines? We have tried, uh, Tyler, for this whole entire session, the chair of the Firearm Safety and Gun Violence Prevention Caucus, Senator Rosemary Bear, whose district also includes Oxford, yeah. you know, created this bipartisan group of legislators who have introduced almost 60 bills. Mine was not the only one, almost 60 bills where we felt this was sensible uh, reform, gun reform. Uh, they have not had any movement in the House, that's for sure. Not sure how much movement they had in the Senate. But one of the things that we're looking at, because I work with Moms Demand Action, I work for every town for gun safety and every town in Michigan, all of these groups, Pontiac United Crimes, uh, there's so many groups out there now that just want to see a stop to this. And I feel that if the legislature, for partisan reasons, cannot see that this, uh, these attacks on our citizens, on our residents, not just the children, as you said, it's, it's, in, it's in our communities. If they can't see that putting sensible gun reforms in place to help protect our citizens is necessary, I feel we may have to go to a ballot initiative. We're joined by Representative Brenda Carter from Michigan's 29th State Congressional District in Oakland County on the Michigan Megacast. Representative Carter, just a few more minutes with you. I wanna talk about uh, you recently, uh, at the end of last year, at the end of 2021, you secured, helped to secure a $200,000 grant for career navigation at Oakland University. Can you talk about helping to secure that grant and how that's going to be used at the university to help students get ready for their careers and then once they do graduate and they're ready to enter the workforce, hopefully in your local area, in Oakland County, or at the very least, staying put right here in Michigan, uh, that they're able to best put their foot forward. Tyler, we have identified that all of our children in Michigan are not going to be headed to college. We've, we've identified that. And through the work of uh, Carlton Jones and the Talent Development Coalition and Douglas Jones, Pastor jo Douglas Jones of Welcome Missionary Baptist Church, they created this program where they uh, garner our young people in high school and teach them the soft skills they need to go into not only an apprenticeable trade, but if they want to become a nurse or if they wanted to go into culinary, this uh, bridge to these jobs are, it was the uh, reason for why I advocated in Lansing for the $200,000. Now, I had no idea that I would be recognized for something that I just feel that is just necessary for all of our young people who are not college bound. But it was really great to see this program in action. And recently, I, I want to give a huge shout out to Carlton Jones once again, because he's walking the walk and talking the talk. He has another cohort of young people that's coming through this program, and he's getting them ready to just go right into the job market. And that was the reason behind this $200,000 grant in collaboration with Oakland University that does an outstanding job of reaching into our communities and working with our young people who are not college ready. So this was a win-win for not only Oakland University, but the city of Pontiac and surrounding, because we do have young people from Auburn Hills and West Bloomfield and anywhere the young people need this additional little push to uh, start them on the path to being successful in, 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 our, in our society, in our job market. And this is why this money was allocated. And if I could take a minute just to give a little shout out, yesterday at Pontiac City Council, I, I was able to present uh, Kano Phillips of the Clarence e. Phillips Ascend Foundation, $500,000. His program is going into our elementary schools and looking for young people and developing their soft skills, actually working with our teachers and our parents and everybody in the school in elementary 
and getting and su uh, supplying them with the necessary tools they need to hopefully get them through the whole path when they graduated from high school they would be uh, job ready as well so what this is pretty much is workforce development it is educational development. It's assisting underserved communities to help these communities bring these bright and brilliant young people right into, into the market. Because right now I found, and coming from Pontiac School District Board of Education, I found that most children in Michigan who are underserved only need to have a chance. And once we provide them with the resources they need to be competitive, they will not only be competitive, they will excel. Representative Carter, appreciate you joining us. Thanks for being with us today. Tyler, thank you so very much for having me. We're going to take a break on the Michigan Megacast. On the other side, COVID-19, monkeypox, allergies, and more. What you need to know to keep your health in tip-top shape. We'll cover that and more with Dr. Jamie Tuil next on Michigan, on Michigan Megacast. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast, our live daily one hour show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program by visiting civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast page. we will find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Well, between COVID-19, seasonal allergies, monkeypox, and all the other elements that you may be feeling at this time, or illnesses and concerns you may have, there's a lot to think about on the medical side of life in Michigan today. Here now to help clear some of that confusion up is Dr. Jamie Tawil from Grand River Medical Associates. Dr. Tawil, appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for having me, as always. How are things? Appreciate having you on. So uh, last two weeks in the state of Michigan, as we uh, mentioned earlier on in the program uh, from an article from Bridge, Michigan and their coronavirus tracker, case numbers in Michigan continue to be uh, trending upward last week, just around 1,960 <laughs> cases per day. In the past week, it's a, it's just a few shy of 2,000 cases per day. And, and those are being attributed to mostly the BA5 variant of the Omicron, sub-variant of the Omicron variant of COVID-19, but also the BA4 variant. Can you tell Tell us a little bit about what you know about these two sub-variants of the Omicron variant, why they're so much more transmissible, and the ways they're kind of interacting with our community at this time. So the, the BA4 and the BA5 variants are the newest sub-variants of the Omicron virus. And thank you, by the way, thank you for asking, great question. <laughs> The, uh, the, those new variants have identical spike proteins. They're pretty much responsible for up to 80% of COVID uh, infections in Michigan, uh, according to the CDC website. 80% for the BA5, spot, roughly 15% for the BA4. Now, these two viruses have identical spike proteins, which are the proteins that attach to cells and allow them to get in. And the reason this variant is becoming so much more prevalent is because it is irrespective of whether or not you've previously had COVID. So people that have previously had COVID, which, you know, not all people, but a lot of them feel that they have a little bit of immunity since they've been exposed that, all right, I've had it, I'm done, I don't need to get it anymore. Whereas with this particular variant, it is now, you, if you've had it, it is irrespective of whether or not you've had antibodies to COVID, you will still get an infection with this particular variant. So you're seeing people that are getting it two, three times that are starting to just kind of cycle through variants. And that's why it's becoming a lot more noticeable. And it, and, it, and plus, the other thing to this is that you're, you're it, um, <clears throat> excuse me, your you know, window for transmission and your length of being uh, infectious to other people is a little bit longer by a few days. So that means people are still contagious for a little bit longer of a period of time, which also leads to further infections. 
We're joined by Dr. Jamie Tawil from Grand River Medical Associates joining us on the Michigan MagaCast. More information uh, and to get in contact with Grand River Medical can be found at grandrivermedical.com, grandrivermedical.com for more information. And Dr. Tawil, going off of that information, knowing that the, this particular subvariant, these particular subvariants in many cases are able to affect people that have been vaccinated and have and are unvaccinated and those that have some natural immunity as well, many are going to going to then or are currently then asking the question, well, then why do I need to get vaccinated or, or why should I get a booster for COVID-19 if we're, regardless, I'm going to get COVID-19 from these two subvariants? Well, the reason for that is, is because, you know, while the BA5 variant is responsible for up to 80% of the infections that are out there currently, there are still other variants that are still out there. And this will also continue to mutate as always. So any type of, of vaccination that you have to create antibodies to this particular virus will be helpful to some degree. You don't want to backslide or get older variants that are definitely more dangerous than the current one. The BA5, although it spreads more aggressively and it is a much easier to get, to get and it is also resistant to certain types of antibodies, you have to realize that it's a little bit less virulent, which basically means you're not going to be as sick as other people, but the number, the sheer volume of people that will get infected could still become an issue and a burden on the health system. So being able to vaccinate yourself against previous variants, any potential new variants, as well as some degree of maybe even if not mild um, reduction in severity of symptoms, any option that you're going to be able to take to get yourself in a better position than anybody else, I would recommend getting that, that option. I would recommend taking that option. And the, the, the point since the beginning that's been discussed to the communities in regards to these vaccines is that they're not going to prevent you necessarily from getting COVID-19. They're aimed at preventing more severe cases and, and reducing the load that infections our communities have on our, on our public health systems, especially in those areas of, of the state that don't have large hospital systems in the area or even uh, have great medical coverage uh, in terms of primary care physicians in the local area too. Those are really important communities for people to be considering getting vaccinated or taking those precautions because while the spread of COVID-19 has such severe, it can have up to severe impacts on major cities and major metropolitan areas and, and large counties like you know, well, Oakland County, Wayne County, uh, Ottawa County, and so on, others in the UP, many other community areas, many other counties are uh, any sort of additional load on their hospital systems, on their medical systems could be significant and fatal in many cases for people in smaller areas in Michigan. Yeah, absolutely. You wanna be able to reduce that risk and you know uh, anything that you can do to, to, to reduce that burden. I mean, you, you patients have been telling me nonstop, it's, it's a nightmare going to the ER because there's so many patients that are in there for COVID. Uh, you know, and, and that while that number is declining, uh, the amount of people that are getting infected is going up. So even if it's milder cases, people that are going to the ER for, if not just even testing or diagnosing or potential, you know, people that do get COVID want to go in there and get their, infi their infusions of monoclonal antibodies. Although a lot of the monoclonal antibodies that are out there are not necessarily to, uh, as good to fight against the BA5 variant. Some of them still are, as well as uh, BA4 and BA5 are also are, uh, showing that they are responding to the newer drug that's out there called Paxlovid, which is the oral medication that you take. But going back to your, the comments that you're making is, we really wanna just reduce the amount of burden on the healthcare system. When you have a pandemic where you have things that are going on, uh, the availability of help is the basically the most important thing. So if you are flooding that availability with other variants, other issues, uh, it becomes a bit of a problem because people aren't getting the help that they need. And it's, it's frustrating because we're, as a society in most areas, are just used to being able to get help the minute we need it. You can get in to see somebody, surgeon cares everywhere, but when it's overwhelmed, it becomes a problem. And these people are now being forced to wait. And as any illness will, it will, will show you, as history has shown you, time is important. Getting there early, getting treatment quickly, getting treatment aggressively as fast as possible, reduce further bad outcomes down the line. We're joined by Dr. Jamie Tawil. He is a internal medicine specialist at Grand River Medical Associates. Joining us on the Michigan MegaCast, you can keep up to date with uh, Grand River Medical Associates and, and get in contact with them by visiting grandrivermedical.com. Grandrivermedical.com is their page. So all of that being considered, uh, Dr. Tawil, so many people out, out, out here in our communities in Michigan and around the U.S. and in the world right now with the COVID-19 situation being different than what it was maybe a year ago and certainly 
from what it was two years ago. Right now, with everybody getting back out in the society, and in, in so many cases, or a lot of people getting back out in the society, not necessarily everybody, people bring up the question, is, is the pandemic over? And, or they behave like the pandemic is over. <clears throat> is that, where are we in terms of this? Because it is kind of a confusing gray area for so many people where it's not necessarily as intense maybe as it was two years ago, but it's still very much a factor in our communities. Well, absolutely. You know, previous to this, I mean, if you could just remember, it's it, we, we love to forget, but I mean, two years ago, we were in lockdown. We were wearing masks. We weren't able to do anything. We were wiping down our groceries. Nobody knew what was going on. It was a bit of a concern. People were trying to, we were, we were learning as we were going along. And I've used this example in previous interviews with you. I've said it a million times. You're going to hear it again. We, at the time, we were working on a car like doing mechanics work metaphorically on a car while we were driving it down the highway at 80 miles per hour. You know, nothing, we weren't able to really kind of piece things together. We now have so much more knowledge and so many more treatment options that it has now become not as aggressive. We now, if you get sick, you do have Paxlovid, you have remdesivir, you have monoclonal antibodies, you have all these other options. And these options have been proven. And we, although they're still approved for emergency use in some situations, a lot of these things have been helpful. So with that safety net that we are now getting a better grip on our knowledge of what's going on, the, 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 the one factor I wanna make sure that we're aware of is long COVID, you know, the symptoms that go on for long periods of time, things like that, we discussed that last time. It's, that still to, remains to be seen. But for the most part, in terms of infectious and things like that, uh, people have a little bit more of a sense of security. Is the pandemic over? Certainly not. But at the same time, it's not as not as much of a threat as it was previous because A, we have treatments, B, we have knowledge, C, we have an idea of what works and what doesn't, we have precautions that we can still take, and most importantly, we have a variant that is less severe as the previous variants, thank the Lord, but that doesn't mean we can't get a variant that's more dangerous. So uh, keeping our antenna up, so to speak, to make sure that we're not gonna continue to get recurrent variants is important, and I, and I do recommend that people still maintain that level of awareness. We're joined by Dr. Jamie Twill from Grand River Medical Associates on the Michigan Megacast. Dr. Twill, another situation that's uh, giving people some parallels to the COVID-19 situation is seeing the spread of monkeypox being reported across the world, including here in the U.S. and in the state of Michigan. And in this case, this is this is a disease that spreads very much differently than COVID-19. But that being said, with it being spreading around the world and it being spread also uh, here in the state of Michigan in some isolated cases as well, we make those many will make those parallels between these two situations, especially with the pandemic continuing on. Uh, tell us about the monkeypox situation, how it's different from the COVID-19 situation and, and how people should be taking precautions. So monkeypox is a totally different situation. And the reason for that is, is because it is spread differently. Um, the spread is typically through contact with fluids uh, or fomites, which is basically, you know, uh, clothes or surfaces that have fluids on it. And it has to get kind of connected with, uh, get, you know, in into your body via a system of either abrasions, cuts, oral mucosa, things like that. There have been cases where monkeypox can be spread through respiratory droplets back and forth between people, but they have to be in close proximity for an extended period of time. So if you're using the precautions that you're using for COVID, your risk of monkeypox goes down considerably. In addition, it's it's more or less spread also through sexual contact. So making sure that you're maintaining those types of precautions will definitely reduce that risk. It can spread, it does spread. Um, the other issue with regards to monkeypox is getting treated and diagnosed for it. This is relatively, although it's been around for a long time, this is something that we as primary physicians haven't seen in, you know, in my entire practice of medicine, I haven't seen uh, cases of it. There hasn't, there's been mild outbreaks, but none of them have been, you know, near this area. We now have 16 reported cases in Michigan as, as of recently, as of today, I believe, where, you know, the, the, the diagnosis of it, the symptoms of it can mimic other things. You know, they're, they're basically these small, a particular rash that shows these small pustules that can be confused for other problems. So usually a patient will come to a physician with that has not been exposed to exactly what monkeypox is. He may look at it and say, oh, that's a simple infection or a sexually transmitted disease. If you're having a history of sexually transmitted, you know, a history of unprotected sex, you now have a physician that's looking at it going, oh, I don't, I don't know, it's not gonna to be to the forefront of his mind. He will try treating with other options 
if he's not aware of it, if it's not on his radar. Now, once that becomes an issue where physicians now have an idea, hey, this might be monkeypox, we are now further down the line. And as I said previous, you know, the earlier you can get treated, the earlier you can get diagnosed, the better off you are. The other problem that we're dealing with in this particular situation is testing. Testing is very difficult to get. You have to get approval. You have to submit pictures of the rash to, to prove that you have a very strong inclination that this is in fact monkeypox. Once that happens, you get approved. You send them to one of the few labs in Michigan that can do this. And most of those labs are a send out. So it can be up to even up to a week before you actually get a diagnosis. By then we're now worried that the spread may have continued or the person has de declined significantly. Um, uh, health-wise or even possibly improved health-wise. So, you know, it, it's it's the delay in care that's going to be the biggest issue here. <clears throat> Join me, Dr. Jeremy Tawil from Grand River Medical Associates on the Michigan Megacast. You can find more information uh, on how to get in contact with Dr. Tawil as well as the services at Grand River Medical Associates by visiting grandrivermedical.com, grandrivermedical.com for more information. Dr. Tawil, uh, in the past we've talked about uh, people being hesitant to go back to their primary care physician uh, during the throes of the pandemic and even as the pandemic started to change and, and situations outside of the home and the workplace have maybe not been as uh, cautious as they've been in the past. Are we still seeing that as being a bit of an issue uh, in uh, with among your clients, among those uh, that you could converse with in the medical community of people going back to their primary care physicians for those routine checkups? Oh, people are, absolutely. Yeah. Thank the Lord. Uh, people are starting to get back in track. They're starting to, uh, you know, we're dealing with the backlog of all the people that weren't going previous to this now. So things are, you know, my practice is so swelled in business in terms of people that are now, all right, it's been a while. I'm out of medications. I need to be seen. Um, physicians are still offering telehealth services that's still available to a lot of people. And I do it on certain occasions, certain emergencies. Uh, it is definitely something that can be done. People are now becoming more, and, and also I will say that people are also hesitant to go to urgent cares to some degree because a lot of people are just running to urgent cares anytime they have suspicion for COVID. So with that being the case, people are now starting to come back to their primary cares to get all of those routine health screenings and we are starting to pick back up. Thankfully, people are doing much better and I am very pleased for that. Dr. Twill, just another couple minutes with you before we say goodbye today. Anything else that people should be keeping in mind uh, right now on the medical side of things here in the state of Michigan that they should maybe be conversing with their primary care physician about or keep an eye out for in the future? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the big concern is COVID is always at the forefront of people's minds. So everybody always has a sniffle and wants to know if they've had COVID or we at least want to know if they've been tested for COVID. But once that's out of the way, you know, common things are still common. Allergies, still common. You know, issues with regards to cholesterol, sugars, all of those risk factors that make you a, a bigger target for something like COVID, those are still there. So I do want people to come to their primary care physician and please to still get their routine checkups, still make sure that they're being very aggressive about controlling their allergies as this has been a rough season for allergies. Mine include, you probably hear me clear my throat nonstop throughout this interview. Uh, it can be out there. So please bear that in mind. The other thing is, is the, you know, the emotional impact of this entire pandemic. I'm just seeing a lot more patients that are having issues with stress, anxiety, depression, uh, the frustration of working from home, the frustration of, of having to go back. These adjustments can be really, really taxing on you on an emotional level. Uh, people don't always want to talk about their emotional health with their physicians because they feel like it's a sign of weakness. It most certainly isn't. I would encourage them to do that because it's very important to make sure that you're being taken care of on all levels and your mind is your, your strongest organ. So I would want patients to please bear in mind that there, now that the weather is nice, you can go out there and practice a lot of self-care. Please work out, please enjoy the sunshine. Please take care of yourselves and make sure that emotionally you're doing well, your stress levels are managed, you're being treated, you're doing what you can and, and please have those conversations with your doctor. I often feel that that gets overlooked. GrandRiverMedical.com for more information and resources. Dr. Tawil, appreciate your time. Thank you as always. I really appreciate you having me on and allowing me to speak. Always appreciate having you on too as well, Dr. Twill. Man, that's, uh, that's a lot to think about. Let's take a break and ponder that all over. And when we come back, we'll have a little fun. Canterbury Village's Keith Aldridge joins us next on the Michigan Megacast. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine.
the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast, our live daily one-hour show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about our program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on the Megacast link, we'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now is the owner of Canterbury Village, Keith Aldridge, curating fun all across the, the summer, fall, winter, and all seasons of Michigan right here in the Great Lakes State. Keith, thanks for being with us. Yes, good morning. Nice intro. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. A lot of fun coming up uh, in and wrap up the month of July, and we continue on the summer in Orion Township at uh, Canterbury Village. Coming up this coming weekend, it's uh, one of your, your most beloved events, the Michigan Medieval Fair, July 23rd and 24th at Canterbury Village. Tell us about that event and how people can participate. Uh, yeah, well, the event, uh, the, the entertainment is second to none. Um, last weekend was, was the first, it's a two weekend event this year, or two weekend festival, I should say. And, um, you know, I'm pretty hard to please. And last weekend I was walking around and I'm like, man, this, this is good stuff. So if you're in that genre of, of medieval, you want to dress up or you want to come and buy a costume, I mean, there are great vendors on site. Um, Sunday morning I was on uh, Fox and I had some of the garb on, and uh, this stuff is beautiful. I mean, handmade leather, I mean, it's it's gorgeous. So come on out, have some fun. It's a great family event, uh, lots of entertainment. Uh, you can spend a couple hours out here, no problem, have some turkey legs and have a great time. There's so many great medieval fairs and, and renaissance fairs in the state of Michigan, especially over the course of the summer. What sets this one apart in Oakland County at Canterbury Village? Well, we are the only one that really has a medieval village, quote unquote. I mean, that's what Canterbury is. It's based off of an old English village. Uh, we have our own castle and uh, nothing against the other uh, festivals, but they can compare to our architecture and what we have to offer. Obviously, we built a bunch of stages this year for performers. Uh, we have five stages now on, on our campus and uh, all of them are packed with entertainment. Uh, we actually, one of the stages is decked out, uh, looks like a castle. Uh, so it, it's really good stuff. And the gentleman I teamed up with is heavily involved with uh, Renaissance uh, festivals around the country. And uh, he's got uh, grade A, uh, uh, A plus entertainment. So very, very happy with it. And so what sort of entertainment for those that may be interested in going and they just wanna know what they're gonna see in terms of the entertainment, what, uh, who will be there and what will be the performances? 
Uh, well, we have live music, a bunch of different genres of live music, um, you know, the medieval, uh, flute, bagpipes, um, uh, guitars, you name it. Uh, the bands are fantastic on, on multiple stages. Uh, as I said, we have, you know, different uh, medieval type shows on our castle stage, which is really neat. Um, you know, I don't know how moms or dads will feel about this, but we have belly dancers. It's very tasteful, uh, but it's kind of cool. Um, it is very tasteful. So, you know, obviously we're a family uh, event center, but the belly dancers were neat. I, I got a chuckle out of it. And uh, then we have the, the Detroit Fight Club. Um, you know, it, this is a sport to these guys. Uh, they dress in their armor, uh, full full head to toe. And uh, it's kind of like a, a wrestling match. And, uh, you know, it's a point system. Obviously, on the national scale, uh, you know, guys do this for a living. Um, obviously, at Canterbury, it's, you know, it's a little downscale. Um, but uh, then we have the jousters, uh, which is, it's pretty incredible, the jousting. And, and these guys actually joust and hit each other. And, you know, sometimes they fall off the horses and you're like, all right, we're not getting paid for this. You're not in the NFL, but they do it. They love it. And, you know, they're passionate about it. These people are very passionate about their genre and this time, time period of uh, history. More information on this event coming up this weekend, wrapping up this weekend, July 23rd and 24th at Canterbury Village can be found on Canterbury Village's website. That is simply canterburyvillage.com, canterburyvillage.com for more info and to purchase tickets. We're joined by Keith Aldridge, the owner of Canterbury Village, located in Orion Township on the Oakland County Megacast next weekend, July 30th and 31st. Another fun event there as people in Oakland County and surrounding areas can run through platform nine and three quarters, end up over at Canterbury Village to celebrate Harry Potter's birthday weekend. Tell us about that event. Well, we've been doing Harry Potter for a few years. Uh, when we first started it, we were doing it in the wintertime in our castle. Uh, we've kind of outgrown the, the uh, our castle. We can't hold any more people. So we decided to move it to uh, summertime uh, and let people enjoy the, the whole experience at Canterbury Village. And I tell you what, like medieval, obviously the Harry Potter genre, these people are passionate. Sometimes you can't tell the actors from the customers. Uh, they do a great job of dressing up. Uh, and, and it's a cool event. Obviously our campus fits well for the theme. Uh, there's a great scavenger hunt, a lot of activities and a lot of fun stuff to do. And then obviously quality vendors. So if you're looking for that particular wand or sword or something of that nature, you can find it. We're joined by Keith Aldridge. He is the owner of Canterbury Village. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Again, Harry Potter's birthday weekend. That is July 30th and 31st. That's coming up next week. More information can be found on CanterburyVillage.com. And of course, for those of you that are currently watching on TV or on our streams or watching on demand on CivicCenterTV.com this afternoon on our Megacast page, you'll see the Facebook page also with more information on this event. For those of you listening on the radio, again, on demand, CivicCenterTV.com uh, sometime this afternoon. Just click on our Megacast link, click through to watch full interviews, and you can click on our interview from today with Keith Aldridge, owner of Canterbury Village on the Oakland County Megacast. And Keith, we've talked in the past so many times about all the great small businesses that also called Canterbury Village home. There's so many great events throughout the year that often attract people to Canterbury Village. And one of the great benefits of that is that they're able to uh, patronize these local businesses as well. You have another great event coming up at the beginning of August, the 6th and the 7th at Small Shop. Uh, sh it's Shop Small, Shop Local weekend at Canterbury Village. Tell us about that and how people can participate. Yeah, it's a free weekend at, at Canterbury. Uh, come on out, obviously support the local businesses, no matter where you're at. Canterbury Village, any downtown markets that you might be, uh, you know, uh, by. Obviously, there's a place for Walmart and uh, Amazon.com, but help out these small guys. Uh, it's important to the life bread of uh, any local community. Um, so for shop, small shop, uh, local shop Canterbury weekend, we just have street performers. We're going to have our own Princess Joslyn out here, which we've introduced at, uh, at Pirates and Princesses. It's gone kind of well. And uh, we have live entertainment. It's just kind of a chill weekend, if that's the proper terminology. But uh, yeah, come on out, listen to some music. Uh, get some uh, donuts at uh, Yates Cider Mill and have some fun.
More information on CanterburyVillage.com. CanterburyVillage.com. And that event is August 6th and 7th. As we preview that event, can you tell us too, because even though uh, that event isn't until August, these small businesses continue to operate at Canterbury Village throughout the year. Can you give us an example of some of these businesses that people may be able to interact with that are based right here in Oakland County uh, and they can interact with the Canterbury Village on a regular basis? Yeah, so obviously our, our, our best known partner would be Yates Cider Mill. Uh, Yates Cider Mill number one, the big one in Rochester. Obviously the, the road is torn up if anybody knows that area over at DeQuinder there. Uh, there's some serious construction problems. I feel bad for Mike and his, and his family. Uh, so come on out to Yates uh, at Canterbury, plenty of parking, lots of room, and you get the great, uh, the, the same great cider and the same great donuts. And even we offer more baked goods here at Canterbury, which is kind of neat. Uh, we have a couple great small shop owners. Uh, one's called the Wooden Tulip. So if you are if you have a trendy high school student or moms that are very trendy and like, uh, like the shop, um, you know, Jim and Becky do a wonderful job uh, stuffing their store with, you know, the most unique and the most fashion uh, type of stuff that's out right now. They, they have gotten a great following. Uh, they've been with us for three years now and have a huge following in the Lake Orion, Oxford area. Uh, we have Scott's, uh, Scott's Farm General Store. They do a nice job. Uh, obviously, uh, the vegetables are coming into season now and lots of fun stuff there. Then we have our six uh, shop owners in the back, the small houses. Um, a big variety of people. They've been with us for three or four years now, all the shop owners. Come on out and support them, and, and they do a great job. We're joined by Keith Aldridge. He's the owner of Canterbury Village with us on the Oakland County Mega Cash. You can find more information on all of their upcoming events and also the small businesses housed at Canterbury Village by visiting canterburyvillage.com. Another great event coming up as we talk about supporting local and shopping local. Uh, we, can, we also want to talk about shopping Michigan Made. You have a specific event for that. August 26th through the 28th, it is the Michigan Made Festival at Canterbury Village. Uh, give us a preview of that and just what sort of Michigan business are going to be uh, housed at Canterbury Village for people to, to meet and, of course, buy some products from. Yeah, so this has turned into one of our bigger events on our calendar. Um, what we do, which I think is pretty cool, we give free vendor space to any, any vendor that is 100% Michigan made. So if you make your candles at home or you make your wood signs at home or whatever you do, your paintings, it's all handmade. You get a free booth at Canterbury that weekend. And uh, so far, we have our over 65 vendors signed up already. And obviously, what do we have? Uh, six, six, seven more weeks until the event kicks off. Uh, so we'll hit, we'll max out at 80 vendors, which is as, you know the, as much as we want to hold at Canterbury. And it's just a great way to you know uh, shop local and shop meet uh, ideas and and uh, help out those small business owners that uh, you know might work during the week and try to make a little side money on the weekends. Going into the fall and into September, you also have some car shows coming up at Canterbury, Canterbury Village. Can you preview that event for us? Yeah, uh, uh, obviously the holiday weekend, we have the Corvette uh, Fest, which is uh, a charity for leader dogs of the blinds. I think they've been at Canterbury for oh, 15 or so years now, maybe even more. Uh, Wally Ager is a big sponsor of that. So I uh, tip my cap to Wally Ager, which is our local Chevy dealership here in, in Lake Orion. Um, and a big supporter of our community. And then the, then we have the Cor uh, Cobra, uh, Great Lakes Cobra uh, Car Club out as well. And obviously, if you're a, a lover of the, uh, you know, Ford vs. Ferrari movies, come on out and see the Cobras. I mean, some of the coolest cars in the world ever made. So uh, it's, it's a nice weekend, nice family weekend. Come on out, have some fun, and uh, see some beautiful cars. Well, tell us more about the process that you go through as the owner of this business and, and as you're running this business to plan these festivals. Just how far in advance are you and your team at Canterbury Village considering what to do next year and what to do, do the year after that and getting the ball rolling on all these different and great variety of fun for the whole family at Canterbury Village? Yeah, it's, it's basically, you know, obviously right after the year ends uh, with our holiday stroll and then our mitten drop. I mean, the, the first week in January, we're planning on the calendar. Um, obviously, we've already even started on the calendar already for next year. Uh, see what events we want to add and what events maybe uh, didn't really work for families in, in Oakland County. 
So it's a, it's a constant process and our team does a great job. We got some great people, obviously a, a business of this size, you can't do it all by yourself. So our team does a wonderful job and uh, you know, finding unique vendors, uh, unique acts and uh, just providing a great product and, and a cheap family entertainment for people. Um, you know, obviously the inflation is killing everybody right now, gas prices. So if you wanna have a lot of fun, staycation, come on out to Canterbury Village and uh, it almost feels like you're in a different time time period out here. Lastly, uh, another another event on the docket for uh, September as we get into not, um, more of the fall kind of weather around the time of September 10th and 11th, we have Michigan Donut and Ice Cream Fest happening at Canterbury Village. Give us a preview of that event here, Keith. Well, that's kind of tr the tradition, isn't it? Uh, after the holiday weekend, uh, all the cider mills kick into full gear. Uh, and uh, we've been doing this event for a few years now, and it's it's a popular event for us. Obviously, having one of the most quality uh, uh, cider mills on, on site with Yates Cider Mill, I mean, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer for us. Lots of good family entertainment. Come on out, fill up on some, uh, you know, yummy, tasty donuts and fill up on some ice cream. Who doesn't love that? Obviously, the weather's usually pretty solid uh, first couple of weeks in September. So let's have some fun, right? Joined by Keith Aldridge. He is the owner of Canterbury Village in Orion Township. You can find more information on all their upcoming events uh, throughout the rest of the summer into the fall and throughout the rest of the year. Keep up to date with them at CanterburyVillage.com, CanterburyVillage.com, where you can also purchase tickets to these events. And, and if you're interested in being a vendor at some of these events and participating yourself, you can also get in contact with Keith and the team at Canterbury Village who join us on the Oakland County Megacast. Keith, another minute or so with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else that people should be keeping in mind as they head to Canterbury Village this summer or uh, things that maybe they should be keeping a lookout for in the near future? Yep, and we, well, a couple of things. Obviously, you know, we have our own food bank here at Canterbury Village. So anytime you, you wanna come out to Canterbury, please uh, bring some uh, box goods, some dry goods. Um, you know, our, our food pantry right now with inflation is being very, very um, uh, busy. Um, so please uh, help families out that need some help. Um, you know, if you're fortunate, please help some people that aren't as fortunate. And then obviously wrapping up for the uh, holiday season, we'll team up once again with the Bottomless Toy Chest. Um, we do a lot of good work or the Bottomless Toy Chest does it. We're, we're just part of it. The, the Bottomless Toy Chest does all the work. Um, you know, giving gifts to kids uh, that are, are struggling through some, um, you know, difficulties at, at the local hospital. So please support our charity um, initiatives and, and we sure do appreciate it, Metro Detroit. Keith, we appreciate you joining us and telling us more about all these great upcoming events. Uh, of course, the small businesses and your charitable contributions as well at Canterbury Village. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. That's going to do it for today's edition of the Oakland County and Michigan Megacast. Tune into the Oakland County Hour, 10 a.m. to 11, Monday through Friday, Michigan Megacast, 11 o'clock to noon. We'll be back tomorrow with more of the Megacast.